And welcome back to the NWA 1983 Project. I'm your host, Lex G. And with me, as always, is Matt Riley. How are you doing tonight, Matt? Oh, dandy. Dandy. <laughs> so tonight's episode is going to be another compilation show of some of the great wrestling action uh, throughout the NWA. Most notably going on is the United States Tag Team Tournament. Lots of great teams in there. We have the uh, Minette Express, we have the Guerrero Brothers, we have the Briscoe Brothers, we have the Funk Brothers, we have the Von Erich Brothers, lots of brother tag teams in there. We have the Fabulous Ones, and we have Giant Baba and Tenru from Japan. So I'm um, really excited to see how that kind of plays out there. I think, Matt, you said that your pick is the Midnight Express. Okay. I can't make a pick because I already know the results. Because, guys, I taped these about two months in advance. So I can't give you my pick. But uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, it's going to be chock full of surprises. A couple of upsets in there as well. So pretty stoked to see that. In addition, on this episode, you will see the debut of Jesse, the body Ventura. Now, before you guys chop my head off, <laughs> I'm going to explain this as a talent exchange with the AWA. So we're going to send them like Dusty and Dick Murdoch and Flair, maybe Race, and they're going to send us Jesse Ventura for right now for a couple of shots, not too many, just a few shots he's going to make for us. And we're also going to negotiate a deal to get Nick Bachman to come in to face Harley Race down the road. And you may see Hulk Hogan face Antonio Inoki in Japan. Card is subject to change on that, folks, by the way. So um, real interesting there. Hey, not for nothing, the AWA and NWA were pretty liberal with the talent exchanges. I think more so than the WWF at the time. Although the WWF, you know, did send a lot of people to Florida, but you never saw like WWF guys go to Crockett unless it was Andre the Giant for the most part. Yeah. So our good friends, my friend Vern, my buddy Vern, we go out hunting and stuff. So Vern. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Vern hanging out, and he's gonna give us a couple of uh, a couple of uh, steady hands, so we can do some business. This will be our setup show for our next show at the Mid South Coliseum. So we're going down to Memphis, and the main event of that show will be Randy Savage versus Jerry Lord inside of Steel Cage for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. So again, that's gonna be a lot of fun, and uh, real anxious to see that as well. So just going off a couple of things, I've been watching uh, quite a bit of uh, wrestling as of late. I just subscribed to the HighSpots.com's uh, network. Want to check that out. They had a lot of cool stuff on them. They had a nice documentary on Terry Funk. They have a good documentary on Harley Race. Uh, so I watched those. Those were fantastic. So I definitely recommend those. And if you want to buy them on DVD or do a direct download or subscribe to the channel, I definitely recommend that. So two thumbs up. So I was, I was thinking to myself the other day, and you, we know we're going to have some guys leave the NWA here you know, coming up very shortly. We already had Andre Giant leave. Again, based on my assumption that Vince kind of got the idea we're going national, he's taking Andre from us. Yeah. In addition, uh, Sergeant Slaughter went over to the WWF too. So what are you going to do there? But – it does bring up an interesting topic as we get further along in this process. So in a consolidation of the NWA, which we're trying to do, we're making the NWA national. We're going to change the NWA office. In this fantasy world, I purchased the NWA myself. I have a big influx of cash. So I'm not really super dependent on the 3% that the champion gets, although I will still collect it because I am a promoter. <laughs> um, but we're going to move the NWA kind of office from, you know, basically it would go around to the different, you know, presidents. So, but it was basically held out of St. Louis for the most part. Again, I spent some time, you know, wherever, you know, the president was, right? So if it was in, if Jim Crockett was the president, you know where it's going to be. If Fritz was the right. president, you know where it's going to be at. But we're moving our main headquarters, or the booking office, as they like to call it back in the day. We're going to move it to Los Angeles, California, Hollywood. NWA is going Hollywood, folks. So it brings up an interesting point as we get later down the road. Again, we're going to lose, guys. You know, history tells us that. But the question I have to ask myself is that, hey, listen, we're going to try bringing celebrities here. We're going to do a, a different kind of pace match than you know you would see initially out of the NWA. Um, we're going to try to get these guys commercials, movies. You know those kind. Of, you know those kinds of deals. Yeah. And if you were, if we're drawing and these guys are making tons of money and we're talking about profit sharing, some of the other 
crazy concepts that um, they'll tell me no. So imagine me going to Bill Watt saying, hey, we should do some profit sharing. Probably yeah. slap me, throw me out the window, but you know what have you. I talk about signing contracts so you're not allowed to you know, sell your promotion to anyone that the NWA does not approve. Uh, I, know, I know I mentioned that in a previous episode. So um, those whole things won't happen, and we're actually going to start paying TV companies to make sure that they carry our show so Vince can't go in there and uh, buy TV away from us. So you know, the first big move is moving the promotion into Los Angeles, and that's where we're going to be you know, my territory. I'm going to be the new LA promoter. <laughs> you know, me and my good friend, Gene LaBelle. So, Judo Gene. Yeah. You're going to run the show over in, in Los Angeles. Um, that's also going to be the basis of our national uh, program on ESPN. So that being said, well, all that stuff, influx of cash, deals outside of wrestling, Maybe getting a doll here and there, maybe an action figure. Would some of these guys go to WWF? Like if Piper's making money and he has vision of going to Hollywood, wouldn't be part of you know being part of the booking office out of Los Angeles kind of help him in that endeavor? Again, we're, we're talking about changing the concept of the NWF brand. So when we're at Madison Avenue, we're going to be on every PWI. We're going to get some advertising people in here to kind of really help us out. What did Jesse Ventura consider going – instead of going from the AWA to the WF, would he be willing to go from the AWA to the NWA? Would Piper leave? Would Hogan want to come in instead of going to WWF? And those are questions I have to ask myself because I have these decisions to make as we get through the year. Piper leaves the NWA right after you know, Star Kid 83, and that's going to run into our – because the game works from April to May. So you know we're going to have Star Kid in the middle of the year for this game. So i got to ask myself, would these guys still – leave would i lose a junkyard dog in 85 i'm gonna use a steamboat in 85 i'll use a dynamite kid in 84 you know these guys all go would they stay so i have to make those determinations of who's gonna stay who's gonna go what new guys to bring in and uh, and do they fit our vision of what the nwa will be going forward because although i do love you know the style of the 70s and your jack briscoes and your harley races you know would that be viable going into the 80s where i'm looking at guys like oh I have Rick Steamboat, I have Ric Flair, I have Dynamite Kid, I have Ted DiBiase, I have this guy, that guy, and the other guy that has a younger style. I'm going with younger guys. I'm going to go with uh, Rock and Roll Express and the Freebirds. And, you know, maybe the guys like the Mass Assassin and the Mass Superstar and Jimmy Valiant I would keep because I love Jimmy Valiant. I think he fits. But, you right. know, Mr. Wrestling 2 and Oahu McDaniel. And even in some cases a Harley Race, although I would keep him, down, you know, keep him around as a, you know, upper mid card guy. Terry Funk, I would keep. Would you keep Dory? You know, he is that, you know, you know, that style of the '70s. And you know, if we want to compete with Vince, and we want to be you know, not so much rock and wrestling, but we want to change, we want to modernize wrestling here a little bit, and really, you know, get closer to you would see later on, like in '85 and '86 at Crockett. You know, the fast paced styles, good matches, and although we're bringing in celebrities and we're gonna do all the pop and circumstances, we're still going to have a the better in-ring product because that's first and foremost. Right. So I figured with, you know, imagine Steamboat versus Dynamite. Imagine Flair versus Dynamite. I want to use Terry Taylor. I want to use this guy, that guy, and the other guy, you know, instead of these, you know, kind of old-timers that want to you know, fade away, unfortunately. So, again, it, it makes the point, like, would these guys leave? Could we attract a new talent that was never really big NWA guys before? You know, you know, would Savage leave? I don't know. Yeah. So I got to make those decisions as they come up. And, you know, I think that's where we kind of, for the first time, we're going to kind of, although we started already diverging from history. So even the even though with the race title win, it's earlier than it, it was. You know, I think it was in the summer. And this happened in the in the spring. So, you know, maybe it's not race and Flair at Starcade. Maybe it's Flair and Savage. Who knows? I don't book these, so I make the matches, and the computer lets it go. So whatever the computer says is what we go with on this. So uh, you might see some you know wacky stuff, and you know what are you gonna do with the Japan guys? You know what are you gonna do like Anoki and Baba are gonna leave? They have their own promotions. Would I consider to put Baba in matches with Race, especially in Japan? And what if Baba wins the belt? So you know those are the you know as a booking kind of simulation, what this is. It's like Right, I got to deal some, with some real stuff here, and and I got to make you know decisions to kind of make the NWA into you know what my vision is, and it's you know fast pace. You kind of your your Crockett eighty five eighty six style young guys, 
great matches, great interviews, national TV on two cable networks, going around the world, big stadiums, that kind of stuff with your celebrity involvement, um, guys getting into movies. I'm like, hey, Terry Funk, you know Sylvester Stallone, he's your buddy. Have him come yep. down to the matches. We'll, 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 we'll film something with him in the front row. Hey, Jesse, you know Barry Bloom. Barry Bloom is tight with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Have him come on down. Schwarzenegger likes wrestling. You see him all the time. You think he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, Lone, I make the point that Rocky's wrestling angles is played out over a movie. You know, he booked Hulk Hogan and he booked Terry Funk a bunch of times for movies. So, you know, why wouldn't these guys be seen, especially if it's the hot place to be? So, I want, like, you remember how the forum was in the 80s? The LA forum? Yeah. Where, like, the Lakers and Showtime, and you would see Jack Nicholson, and you'll see this celebrity, that celebrity in the crowd. That's what I want. I don't want my celebrities in the ring. Unless they're like a football player, like Richard Ray Perry or something like that. And even that, I'm like, eh, maybe guest referee on the right. outside. If you're going to make this the cool place to be, you got to have the celebrities there in the, in the, you know, in the front row kind of. You know, they're wrestling fans cool. They like wrestling. So do you. I don't care. I'll pay these guys. I'm like, hey, 10 grand sitting in the front row. Wear, wear a Ric Flair shirt. I'll give you the shirt too. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's some of those things that Dusty was thinking it, but Dusty was way too regionalized. Because he would bring celebrities in, like Willie Nelson. Yeah. And he would bring in, like, NASCAR drivers. And that's all, and that's great, and that's cool, and that would probably work five years prior. But when you're on national television and I'm watching, you know, World Championship Wrestling, you know, on TBS, 605, in New York, I'm living in a suburb of New York City, I'm like 45 minutes away. I don't know who any of these people are. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, so I'm looking for national national stars and sort of celebrities as well. Not that we couldn't have a NASCAR in. And Willie Nelson did the national anthem in uh, 1991. So, But they always do. They always have like weird celebrities. And it wasn't until like Hogan came in the WCW where you got people that I knew, like Shaq and, and George Foreman and stuff. Right. It'd be like Aaron Neville. And like Aaron Neville's a hell of a singer, but I don't really know you. So they would bring in – and they would have like these concerts too because – so people forget that you know Jim Crockett Senior and Junior they were they were they promoted anything they promoted stuff outside of wrestling, right? So they would have like the, the circus come in and they have the Harlem Globetrotters come in and they would have concerts and shit like that. So you know they had access to these people, but it was like from a national audience or even an international audience, people were not I don't know who they are. You know they didn't bring in Joe Frazier. Was Joe Frazier like you know eighty four? Joe Frazier like is he still a thing? Yeah, Former Frazier world world like, champion, washed up in a bum. Like think, really, and and I know WWF will get Joe Frazier in '86. I'm aware of this. And please don't call me on that. But WWF comes in with Ali. You come in with Frazier. Frazier's a great fighter, but he's not the star that Ali is. Right. You know, I mean, and that's like one of the big differences there. <laughs> you know, Dusty. You know, Dusty always thought he was uh, John Wayne. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But like even like, even when they were in TBS in the in the late eighties, they're bringing celebrities like off off of TBS. So like you know the the famous match with Sting and Flair, right? The the, the Clash of Champions, the first one. Right. And they had the judges. Oh yeah, three judges. Jason Hervey. Jason Hervey was one. Which okay, I'll give him Jason Hervey. I would prefer Fred Savage, but okay, I'll take Jason Hervey. Yeah. Then you had the guy who played Eddie Haskell and Leave It the Beaver. Yes. And then you had the play, uh, penthouse pet or playmate of the month or whatever. And then you had Sandy Scott. But it was the penthouse pet of the month, not the playboy playmate of the month. For those of you who like that sort of thing, I think that makes a difference, right? Hey. You know, it's like you're bringing her in, and you know, I don't know years later, but you know, it's like WWF years later bringing in pamela anderson jenny mccarthy you know what i mean you want to go nude models that that's your i don't know it, it, it bugs me out but you know that's what we're going for and and you know in the comment section leave a comment you think piper would stay you think hogan would come over you think jesse would come over you think you can steal some guys from the wwf who would definitely not come we'll find out we'll find <laughs> out you know? so we'll, we'll go from there so this episode is going to be an overall conocopia a jambalaya, so to speak, of wrestling topics here. 
And I know I mentioned earlier that I was watching the High Spots Network that I subscribed to, and I came across the International the International Wrestling Association from 1975. And for me, the you know I'm someone who collects wrestling footage, and I have quite a bit of it that I'm able to watch. I'm always looking for new things to watch that I haven't seen before, and this is one of them. So the IWA, or to differentiate from the, all the other IWAs, is like the one in Puerto Rico and Japan and Mid South. I'm gonna call it IWA 1975. Just okay. you know, just so we have a, a frame of reference. Someone will come in, they'll start watching half the video, and they think it's like we're talking about IWA Mid South. IWA 1975 was founded by Eddie Einhorn and Pedro Martinez. We'll go into Pedro Martinez in a little bit. Eddie Einhorn being notable for being a minority shareholder owner of the Chicago White Sox. Do you like wrestling? I guess he was someone you call a money mark, right? That's what they call him nowadays, money mark? Yeah, right. <laughs> so this promotion was intended to be the first national promotion, national syndicated television, the whole nine, right? They had, I know they had TV up in here in New York and WOR, channel, which is Channel 9 up here, for those who don't know that. But they basically stayed in the Mid-Atlantic region, which is, again, weird. Um, at some point, they figured out they couldn't go into Bad Square Garden, which, you know... Basically put the you know death nail in their company there. Um, <laughs> one of their early shows. So the Roosevelt Stadium in New Jersey. And the main event of that show is Ivan Koloff versus Mil Maskeris. No, they, no. No, they drew 14,000 people. Wow. So you're sitting there like, holy shit, okay. No, we got something here. And what they did is they offered guaranteed contracts to <laughs> the biggest stars that they could get. So their roster was pretty good. You know, that Ivan Koloff, they had Mil Maskris, they had Ernie Ladd, Mighty Igor, Bulldog Brower, you know, a lot of big name talent for the time. Surprised they didn't get Black Bull. I'll go into the whole Black Bull thing because I think that's a load of shit. I don't think it's true. Yeah. It's true that they threatened that, but I don't th- I never heard anyone of any significance getting Black Bull and they were Black Bull forever. At some points they all came back, but whatever. So again, their biggest thing is like, hey, we're going to go into New York. We're going to take on the McMahons. Then they, they find out that they had a... And their contract with Madison Square Garden, the WWF, does a thing where they get premier tenant status. So they go into Madison Square Garden and it's like, listen, you can't have a show, a wrestling show, six months from our show. Well, if you have you know, six months from your show, then you have the next show, that's a full year. So they're locked out. Or it might have been, you know, whatever premium return, you know, time where, you know, no one else could get an opening to Madison Square Garden. That's why no one else ran Madison. The WCW didn't run Madison Square Garden. Crockett's didn't run it. So that's the reason why. Which is technically illegal, but the way they framed it, and I believe in the contract and the agreement, they made it not illegal. You know, it's still a load of shit because that, that kind of just kills your competition there. From what I understand, they couldn't get into not only Madison Square Garden, but not, uh, they couldn't get into Nassau Coliseum. They couldn't get into the Meadowlands. <laughs> so, trying to run New York uh, without those three buildings, you got nothing. You got nothing. The company itself is a descendant of the National Wrestling Federation, which is another interesting promotion. I believe that was also based out of New York as well. So that's a whole other whole other topic for another time. They also tried to sue Jim Crockett for antitrust violations. Because um, <laughs> once they moved away, kind of going from after New York, they went into Mid Atlantic, which wouldn't be the territory that you would really want to go into. Like you go, you gonna start in New York, then you are gonna go into Mid Atlantic, yeah. and okay, why don't you go right into Minneapolis next time? Yeah. Jesus Christ! So they scaled it down. It lasted like three years. Mill Maskers never lost the belt or lost to anybody. I find it really interesting that they had Mill Maskers as the champion, and, and I know they're probably going after a Latino crowd at that point. Yeah, but dude, you never put anyone over. And not only did they put him over, he made everyone else look like shit. Like, no one looked good wrestling Bill. He was just Goldberg or Goldberg or Road Warriors, like Smash guys. Do his shit, you know, his, you know, his flips and shit, and then beat him. <laughs> so they only had one IWA champion. They had two North American champions. So they originally had Ox Baker in there. And I believe Ox Baker got cold feet and it's like, no, I'm leaving. And then in the Phantom title switch, they put the belt on Bulldog Brower, which is a big name. Bulldog Brower. Yeah. He, he feels seats, baby. He did. He did. Bless his heart. 
Again, I guess, I guess you would classify this as an outlaw territory anyway. But, you know, whatever. Then you had the Mongols. Guido and Bolo Mongol. That's their name, which is weird. Guido Mongol and Bolo. I wonder if they're brothers. Like, are they Mongols? Or their last name Mongol? They dress like Mongols because they had like the thing in the, like the hair in the front and the little like ponytail thing in the back. Yeah. But basically, they're just two jacked up dudes. Like, they're fucking huge. One of them being uh, Billy Eady, better known as um, the Mass Superstar. No, oh. Better known as Axe from Demolition. And he was huge. So here, comes the axe. Yeah, here comes the axe. Here comes the smasher. Yeah. <laughs> They're demolition. They are demolition. So I think overall, I mean, they have lots of great footage because they taped their shows because they had the idea that, hey, we're going to show these tapes you know, all over the place. So their footage is actually pretty much intact. And they had freeze frames and replays. And like they really had some state-of-the-art stuff. Like, it, like their footage looks great. Like the stuff in the ring is not the greatest. Like the work. But the fucking look of like the way it was shot was good. The overall quality of the production value was good. It looked great. It looked better than WWF. I'll tell you that much. And they kept their tapes. A lot of these guys um, erased their tapes when they were done with them. Because you know <laughs> t- tapes back like they weren't like in, in the eighties they got cheap, but back in the day it was like a hundred bucks for a tape. And you know how some of these promoters are like screw this, I'm just gonna tape over it. So in late seventy five, Einhorn left the IWA and. He had a big financial loss, five hundred thousand dollars. He lost in one year, in nineteen seventy-five. I mean, adjusted for inflation, I don't know how much that money is, how much how much money that is, but shit, that has to be a lot of dough. It's probably at least a million. Yeah, at least. And that's like, ugh. but you know, they give it a shot, and you know, again, this is one of the times where you see like the money mark comes in, big big wrestling fan. I have all this money. We're going to go national. We're going to compete with everyone. And these guys have to understand that when you have a promotion, you got to start off small. You can't go in and try to conquer the world. It doesn't work. I don't think if you had someone with a $500 million right now, they can compete with events. Like you need like a billion dollars. Yeah. And infrastructure. And that, and you still probably be a close number two. <laughs> Ron Martinez, someone I've never heard of. That's what that is. Yeah. Um, Jack Reynolds, and some of you may know Jack Reynolds for his time in the WWF. He was uh, one of the main announcers, and he was the host of Primetime Wrestling when it first started with Jesse the Body Ventura. This is before they switched to Gorilla, and way before they switched to Gorilla and Bobby. So, you know, after it all was said and done there, and, and Einhorn left, Johnny Powers became the Booker. I don't know a whole lot about Johnny, Johnny Powers. Yeah, I guess he was like a jobber. I want to say a jobber. I think he was just like. Journeyman. Mid-card. Sounds like a jobber. He does sound like a jobber. Yeah. He was a North American champion in 1973, though. Oh, well. So, good, good for him. It is. <laughs> he became the booker, and um, that's when they started basically running in Virginia, North Carolina for a couple of years, and um, that was it. They lost their lawsuit against Jim Crockett uh, Promotions, and, and that was it. They closed in 1978, so they made it three years. And just to go over some, the roster they compiled over the three years... And this is going to be interesting. They had the Cuban assassin, Gino Brito, Tony Romano, Afa and Sika, the Samoans, Ox Baker, Sweet Daddy Banks, George Becker, Mike the Hippie Boyette, Dino Bravo, Chief White Cloud, Nelson Royal, Al Costello, Great Goliath, Chief White Owl, Nick DiCarlo, Bill Eady, Bobo Mongol, Cowboy Bob Ellis, Reginald Love, Rip Hawk. Paul Figueroa, Buck Forrest, Pierre Martel, Mighty Igor, Bulldog Brower, Carlos Colon, Big Bad John, Eric the Red, Lars Anderson, The Golden Gladiator, Hartford Love, Danny Sharp, Frank Maroney, Don Fargo, Ernie Ladd, Jerry Lawler, Luis Martinez, George Cryberry Cannon, which is like a 500 pound manager. He was weird and a little bit gross. But bless his heart. <laughs> Betty and Billy McGuire, Tex McGenzie, Tiny Bell, Ali Baba, Killer Carl Coop, Stonewall Jackson, Butcher Brannigan, which is an awesome name, by the way. Carl Von Strom, Strom, Strohem, Strohem, Carl Von Strohem, Juan Sebastian, Thunderdome Patterson, Miguel Perez, Ivan Koloff, The Magnificent Zulu, I believe he was in Memphis. <laughs> He's a Memphis guy. 
Buddy Porter, Whipper Watson Jr., Sylvester Ritter, who is the Junkyard Dog, Hey, Mil Mascaris, Tomas Marin, Kurt Von Schoen, Tony Marino, Frank Stanley, Dick Stibor, Dale Starr, Jerry Summers, Beautiful Bruce, Guido Mongol, Beautiful Kurt Von, Bruce. Yeah, Beautiful oh. Bruce. Or Bruce Swayze, if you want to be a jerk about it. Kurt Von Hess, Troy Graham, Luthez, Rip Tyler, Michael Martell, Johnny Powers, Andre Carpenter, Pistol Pez Watley, Jim Wilson, Craig Valentine, Billy Hines, Abdul Zatar, Ali Tago, Bad News Beach, Bill Williams, Bull Gregory, Buzz Tyler, the Cuban assassin number two. Don't you Number two? Number two. Oh my god. Johnny Hunter, Johnny Ringo. L.D. Lewis, Marshall Lewis, Mike Freeman, Sonny King. He was awesome, by the way. Sonny King, I believe, was a jobber for, for Crockett. I want to say. I might be wrong. And Victor Rivera was the last uh, last guy on their roster. Again, not all these guys wrestled at the same time. A lot of them did. A lot of them left early. Once they took their money and went home, basically. <laughs> um, but they had some huge stars. I mean, you're talking about Ernie Ladd, Jerry Lawler. Well, Mighty Igor, Burbo Brower, Carlos Cologne, like these guys, these guys are big, big stars. Fucking Luz Fez is there. Mil Mascaris. Um, so they gave it they gave it a legitimate shot here. It wasn't like they were short on talent anyway. Probably a bad area to start wrestling though. I don't think you would really go into New York and try to run against Vince. Um, yeah. like right off the bat. But again, they were descendant of the National Wrestling Federation, which was going up against Vince, and I believe lost the promotional war. But fuck, I would go into somewhere like where no one's at, where there might be star for wrestling, or like your opposition's not going to be that tough. Denver, Colorado. It's like a solid date of AWA. But you probably could have took that. Or fucking North Dakota or something. Yeah. You know, who am I? Who am I? I'm nobody. So, <laughs> so Matt, I know, you, I know I sent you some, uh, some clips of the IWA, and uh, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, it reminds me of, I used to see these shows every so often randomly on, you know, cable access, and it would be like, former star, you know, something like Mil Mascaris. Is he one of the most overrated stars of all time? They booked him everywhere, because I think that's the only name they knew in Mexico. Right, like, he, he, he was the guy, the first guy to kind of get his name out there, or if you want to call it that. He was on the magazines, too. He had a big presence in PWI. He must have had, like, I don't know, something on Bill After. <laughs> That or like they, they both killed the hooker and they you know had, held it over him. You keep putting me on cover. I um I will challenge anyone who's listening to this um to find a match where he does a clean job. Um I, I challenge anyone to find that. If you can, I will give you a thumbs up and a shout out to the very next show. How about that? That's all I can afford, folks. <laughs> I mean, also got to look at it's it's, nine, it's 75. It wasn't like the WWF. They, they were still doing high schools and shit too back then too. So it's like – but it's again, it's an interesting kind of place in history. And again, it's someone who you – know, they gave it a shot. They gave it the best shot lasted three years. Uh, what are you going to do there? So maybe maybe if they should – you know, it's hard to say because Vince was in and out of the NWA anyway. Like he was in it, then he was out, then he was in it. Like he – like they broke away originally, right, with the – with the Buddy Roger Luthas thing, right? But he rejoined it later. Yeah. He was the champion. So it wasn't like, you know, he's the NWA territory, but not in the, kind of like what Watts was in the 80s a little bit. Like he's he's in it, but he's not really in it. But he's still kind of in it. And he votes for the champion. Fucking Vince Sr., I think, voted for fucking Flair the first time in 80 to be champ. So he had a vote. Yeah. So, you know, what are you on there? So next up on our... Topic jambalaya. I want to talk a little bit about uh, about Lex Luger and, and how my I'm, I'm a Lex Luger apologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I recently watched a couple interviews with Lex. Um, these are fairly recent. I think one for for Cape Faith commentaries. I think another one for RF video. And now, and I think it's because he went through a lot in his life. You know, post wrestling. You have the Elizabeth thing. You have like the temporary paralysis, and he was in a wheelchair for a while. I think he's getting around pretty good now. You know, drug abuse. You know, found God, that kind of stuff. But yeah. so I'm listening to his interviews, and I thought, like, I've seen interviews with him in the past. I'm like, oh. it's not like watching an interview with Dusty, God rest his soul. But it was like, oh, this guy is arrogant. He doesn't know nothing about wrestling. He was just clueless, right? I watched an interview with him recently. I'm like, oh, 
This is a completely different Luger. Now he has passion for the business. Yeah. Now he, he's super humble guy, you know, super nice. It's like, ah, Lex, I just want to go over and give you a hug. He, he finally understood, number one, his place in wrestling history. Yeah. Kind of understood what the fans kind of thought of his work. And and he come to a realization, I think a lot of wrestlers do that maybe after they retire or if still settle down. It's like, and he says, like, dude, if it wasn't for the fans, I wouldn't be anything. Right. You know I mean? And that shook a chord with me because, number one, he's right. But, you know, looking back as I'm thinking back through his career, attitude aside, I mean, I like Lex. I always like Lex. Lex was like one of my favorite wrestlers. It was like Hogan, Warrior, Sting, Lex, Flair, right? And he was always on top, and he had the great matches with Flair, and the less greater matches with Sting, I mean, they were okay. I mean, nothing to write home about. But, you know, I think you put him in a ring today, as he was in, like, 88, he's the top guy. He's the oh, champ yeah. right now. Um, because they work so different now. And a guy of his size you know, was like 6'5", 290, bigger than Cena. In some ways, work works a better match than Cena. And people are probably going to chop my head off for that. Because <laughs> um, Lex did have, like, the stuff he did do, which wasn't a whole lot, all looked really good. Where John, at times, the stuff that he does all the time looks sloppy sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he'll go for, like, the, the STF and, like, flub it every once in a while. Or, like, that springboard stunner that looked gross. You know, every once in a while, like, he's having better ma- – like, John's having fantastic matches, too. That goes, That's credit to him, number one. And yeah. that's also credit to the guys he's been – like, he, he's, he's having, like, five-star matches with AJ Styles, having five-star matches with CM Punk. Uh, you know, I think Luger had – a different quality about him. Like my favorite spot with Luger is like they would send him into the buckle. And he bounces off the buckle and like kills the guy with a clothesline. I was like, oh, like that's that's awesome. It's like a, it's a little, it's a little spot. It doesn't really mean anything in the match, but it's like, oh, that looks that makes him look so awesome. No one ever does that. Everyone thinks the buckle the same way. But yeah, his matches with Flair were like like I watched him. I watched uh, Luger versus Wyndham. And again, this a lot of credit goes to Wyndham, but like Luger's not blown up. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's not fucking up moves. Nope. He's not sloppy. Like I hated his elbow though, because he's one of those guys that instead of dude dropping an elbow, he takes a flat back bump. Yeah. That's really weird. But I think a lot of things that hurt Luger is the same things that hurt Roman. Right? Roman Reigns. Number one I think is his perception. So it's hard to get behind a guy that comes across like he don't give a shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm waiting for that promo, that like that real promo from Roman. He's like, you know, talk about the pressure of being expected to be the best. You know, his lineage with his family, like the, the pressure his family puts on him and that kind of stuff. I want to see that like emotional promo for him. Like, we never got the emotional progr- uh, the, the emotional promo from Luger. You know, nowadays Flair cries through half his promos. You know what I mean? But <laughs> like you see the passion come through. Like waiting for, like you see Flair cutting a promo. On Terry Funk, and you see the passion comes through, right? And that's a big difference with, you know, guys like Flair, Piper, Hogan, then Luger, and like a Roman Reigns. And I think one of the things that hurt Luger was he never beat Ric Flair. Never, ever, ever beat Ric Flair. Yeah. Like, they had a crap load of matches. It'd be, you know, they had their draws or... Luger would win, but not really win. He would have him up in the rack, and he had that trickle of blood, and they called the match for blood loss. And that you know kind of what, stuff. though? I think back, I was the other day, you know, to kind of make this connect to current events. Back in the day when the quote unquote dirt sheets were getting more prevalent before social media, yeah. they, they were hated by a lot of the rest promotions because they couldn't do it. Like, Oh, and he lost with a uh, elbow to the head and bled, and they had to call the match. Wow, they did that in Baltimore, in Greensboro, in New really? Orleans. Like they couldn't do that anymore because it started, people started catching on. Unfortunately, for I think one of the things that hurt the business was they kept doing the same thing every time. Right. Wait a minute. So the road warriors ran out, and they got you know they, they threw the ref over the top rope. They won the titles, but then lost the match by disqualification after the match. 
Now, do you think the promoters like dismissed it? Like, oh, no one reads that shit. Right. Think exactly. Like, well, anyone who reads that's idiots, anyways. And I like, think that to the same kind of point, I think what Donald Trump did in uh, Mexico, huh? Yeah. Was kind of that effect. Like, no one's going to watch this. <laughs> oh, I kept thinking of wrestling promoters. Like, no one watched that show. It's all over Twitter. Ah, no one reads Twitter. Even back to Lex, do you think the, hurt, the, the dirt sheets hurt guys like Lex? Like, they, they, they're probably one of his whipping boys. You like know, him and David Crockett. David Crockett, yes. Luger, if I remember correctly, wasn't, we're talking early 90s here, so it was kind of like his WWE reign. Yeah. I think they were more, from the feeling I remember was that they were felt like he should have pushed to win the title. Like, he should have been like, I need to win the title. And that he just kind of, uh, granted, he left eventually. It's like you should have struck while the iron was hot. Right. I still think that was one of the things they didn't do right. Like, now it's almost the exact opposite. Like, everyone gets a world title run. Right. You know, or some kind of equivalent. Like, everyone wins a world title. Maybe not our truth, but, you know, just about everyone. And it's funny because we can go back and I can go back and list a bunch of names of people who didn't win the title in the 80s, and it's going to be 50 names. You know what I mean? That's how deep that talent was. I just think, too, like in today's current climate, you know, certain guys are world title material, other guys are not. Then they give guys a vanity run. Like, oh, we'll give you two pay-per-views. and Right. It. But I think what happens is you have guys who are typecast, and then what's coming out of that is they're never going to get any, anywhere with the characters. Now, you look at Cody Rhodes. He was like, screw this shit, and he left. All right, all and he, right. I think a lot of the guys should take that notice and go, you know what, maybe it's in my best interest, like, What's his name? Aaron Rex now in TNA. Guy. Uh, well, they really just do it, did it? He's like, I was supposed to get a main event push. I was supposed to be put with Paul Heyman. You guys didn't do anything. I'm leaving. Bye. Right. That's it. So go rediscover yourself. You know, cement yourself as a, a star, and you come back. You know, they're, you know, they're taking guys with, with buzz. So you're doing fantastic on the indies, and you know, you're coming back. They're gonna want to take you. You got a little bit of buzz. You know what I mean? So it's like, but you know, going back to Lex. Again, I go back and, and say like not winning, not winning the title from Flair, and and kind of beating Wyndham and a kind of a abortion of a match at my favorite pay per view of all time, Great American Bash, nineteen ninety one, and then the heel turn there too. Yeah, so like the, all that was a distract that they didn't have the physical belt. With. So, oh no, we wouldn't do. It was like oh, we would send Harley out there. Send uh, that's where they had the tag title as a title belt. There's there's different accounts. So some people say it's a tag title. Some people say it's an old Florida belt. I'm not really sure uh, which one it is, but they did have a new belt made slightly after. But but you know, like, oh, when he wins the belt, do a long shot so they can't see the championship. But everyone like the big gold belt is freaking huge. Like, what are you talking about? Of course, we know the difference. You know what I mean? So it's like, ugh. yeah. I always remember my friends and I. You know, Holly Race comes down to ringside and just goes, "Now's the time!" And Luger's like, "Now? Oh, oh, okay." Pile drives makes the title. And I think what would hurt that match too, and I think I mentioned it before, is like that wasn't the main event of the show. It, it was, was it wasn't the main event. It was Scott Steiner and Missy Hyatt versus Art Anderson and Paulie Dangerously. Oh my god. That closed the show. I believe it was supposed to be like the Steiners versus Arn and the partner. Um for the tag belt or something, and then I think Scotty got hurt. So they booked that in the floor. But damn, put that in the middle of the fucking show. The show's already shit. doesn't matter. Right. But it was in a cage, so they didn't want to raise the cage again. Ugh. Or put the number before Luger and, and Wendell. And that match wasn't bad. It was a good match. But it was that was the weirdest pay-per-view. Because you had, uh, you had Ko- uh, Nikita Koloff versus Sting, and Nikita won. Was that the and, chain match? Yeah. That's the one where, like... He dove over his back, right? Yeah, yeah. Jeez. So you had that finish. You had the Luga turn at the end. Um, you had the six-man ch- match with uh, the Freebirds and Bad Street versus Dustin Rhodes and the Young Pistols. So you had that god-awful scaffold match with Terry Taylor and Steve Austin versus PN News and Bobby Eaton. And I want to say it was Oz versus Ron Simmons on that show. So Kevin Nash versus Ron Simmons was on that show too. And I think it was – I might be wrong on this one. Yeah, Z Man versus the Diamond Stud with Diamond Alice Page. Oh, Z Man. Or as Terry Funk called them, Z Man. And, uh. and I was like, ooh. Oh, you also, 
again, it goes, it goes, it goes more into like how strange the show was. But it's like the yellow dog, which is Brian Pillman on his mask. Right. The yellow dog being a gimmick they did in Florida with like Barry Windham. Yeah. But this is the show where <laughs> Flying Brian goes right in the camera and goes, Johnny, don't be bad. Johnny, be gay. Oh. Uh, like, what? Yeah. I'm like, they didn't even edit it out of the network show. So it's on WWE Network. They didn't edit it. I left it in there. Fuck it. <laughs> it just had Big Josh and uh, versus uh, Black Blood. Was Big Josh, Matt Bourne? Matt Bourne, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Don't the clown for you folks playing at home. And you had the, also the technical masterpiece. I mean, five star. I'm talking about catch as catch can. Go behinds, takedowns, rough and tumble wrestling. You had Ellie Gante versus the one man gang. No, oh, yeah, well, pure Luthez guest referee. Oh, shit, that was awful. Although on this show, and I'll, I'll give it credit where credit's due, they did have the Ricky Morton versus Robert Gibson blow off match. Really? Yeah. Was that when Ricky Morton was Richard Morton? Yes, it was. Part of the uh, York Foundation. York Foundation. I want to say he hit him with a laptop on his knee and pinned him. <laughs> so you had like the heels. You had like like Ricky Morton over Robert Gibson. He's a heel. Nikita went over Sting. Luger went over Wyndham. Then you end the show with Rick Steiner beating Art Anderson and Paulie Dangerously in the cage. <laughs> what? Yikes. Mm. <laughs> he also had an appearance by Dick Murdoch and Dirty Dick Slater. They kidnapped Messi Hyatt, who was supposed to be Rick Steiner's uh, partner. Not this is not Lex Luger's fault. Just not. And then they turned him heel. He did that really good program with Sting, where he Sting was getting the mystery boxes. Oh yeah. So like he opened the mystery box and be Abdul the Butcher in it. Right. It'd be Cactus Jack. <laughs> and then the, the last one was like um, they may have did Rude at one of them. I'm not, I don't remember if they did Rude or not. I think. <laughs> I think they had they had a. Uh, like a caravan, like like harems, the caravan, right? Yeah. Inside is like a scantily clad, for the time, uh, Medusa. And she comes out and blah, blah, blah. I think that's when Luger attacks him and then reveals it. I'm not sure Luger attacks him or Rude attacks him, but I think I want to say it was Luger who attacks him. And then it's like, oh, it was Lex Luger all along. This thing was United States champion and number one contender. And they got, then he got beat up, and then he got sent to the hospital. And then... Paulie and Ruder in the ring. It's like, oh, Sting doesn't make it. He has to you know, forfeit the belt to us. And then Sting makes it from the hospital, being all heroic and stuff. And he comes back and he loses. No. Oh, <laughs> I, I still say the Lex Luger turn on Ricky Steamboat, one of my favorites of all time. Yeah, that would get, they, just, they just turned him like whatever the fuck. You know? And that's they're coming off, they're coming off the... That's after the, the trilogy of matches, right? Yeah. Like, Come on, Ricky. Let's go home. <laughs> and he sure did. I don't think they had any matches on pay-per-view, though. No, I don't think they did either. Because they didn't... Like, after the, after those matches, they didn't really use Ricky all that great. Like, we never... I don't think we ever got the fucking Ricky Steamboat Great Muda match. No. Like, what? I don't understand. I don't understand. She said that bothers me because like they were there. They, they work on pay per view was uh, Great American Bash eighty nine. <laughs> what was the finish of that match? I don't remember. I gotta look at that. I have it. I just bought it. I just bought that that uh, <sighs> Luger wins by disqualification. I remember now because they were doing this thing where Luger was getting disqualified, like throwing people to the top rope, and then like it was supposed to be no disqualification match. So if Luger threw Steamboat over the belt, like over the top rope, Steamboat would win the the belt. And then Luger's saying, "No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to walk out." <laughs> <laughs> so they put the disqualification thing back in, and then he gets disqualified. I yeah, I'd recently bought that show on VHS. I'm actually looking at it. It's in my hand right now. I'm looking at it because the one on the network, their version of it is uh, like fucked up. Like they have a, a two ring King of the Hill battle royal with like. I don't know, like eleven guys, and it's like it's fucked up. Yeah, and 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 it gets a little disclaimer is like, oh, the original footage wasn't you know was in poor condition, blah blah blah. 
and um, you know all that kind of good stuff. So I was like, hmm. I'm like, let me let me uh, let me buy it on VHS and see what it looks like. I haven't even opened it yet, but it has that great. Uh, I mentioned this in another video. That great uh, War Games match with the uh, Road Warriors, Midnight Express, and uh, Steve Williams versus uh, <laughs> Freebirds. All three of them: Jimmy Garvin, Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy versus the Samoan SWAT team. Samoan SWAT team of uh, Sam and Pat too. So, and then you had the uh, Rick Flair versus Terry Funk as the main event. Not the famous match. Not the I Quit match. This is just a regular match. I remember Gordon Sully saying five letters, two words. I quit. <laughs> I think I think you know going back to Luger. I think he gets a lot of shit for the way like his career ended. Yeah. Because I'll be honest, and I like Lex and stuff, but when he got to like ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. Like, like he was just god awful. Yeah. He got a little bit older, coming off injuries. Got a little bit bigger too. Clearly on uh, on dope at that point, I would assume. I think with Luger, what happened, I don't know if it was just one injury or a couple all piling up, his mobility really took a hit, and he, he, he was almost like, if you go to the gym as a machine, you sit down, you put your elbows up, and you twist your body torso-wise, yeah. he, like, almost like a toy, he pivoted up top, like, he, you know, punching, like, the, the, the side punches. I mean, I still, rep- we used to do this routine where, like, in a wrestle, we wrestle like that person in the ring while we were training, right. and he was the one, I always use the... <laughs> the action figure moves because he punched such an awkward way. Did it seem like he couldn't move his hips at all? Yeah, I, I mean, he had later I get replacement, but you like know. he just couldn't move him. It was like yeah. it was so weird. I never got it. But yeah, like the end of his career was like when he's like team of a buff Bagwell. He's in like team package. He started wearing like like um, workout pants. First of all, he started wearing jeans. He joined the wolf pack and started wearing black jeans, which was weird. Then he had like, those weird workout pants. I don't know what happened towards the end. And then the WCW, you know, closed. You know, WWF didn't have a spot for him. He's sitting at home collecting that Turner money. You know, goes on the indies, um, makes an ass of himself a couple different times. Then he got thrown off a plane. He got arrested a bunch of times, and then he had the Miss Elizabeth incident. Oh, yeah. Wow. Ooh. So, you know, he's dating Miss Elizabeth at the time. And whew, they're at his house. And, you know, she took a couple of prescription pills and a couple of glasses of wine, from what I understand, and, and OD'd from that. Yep. And died. I think he just got arrest, arrested like a week before, too, for something weird. Yeah. I don't want to say it was domestic abuse, but it might have been. Let me look that up. I don't want to talk about domestic abuse and shit <laughs> like that without being sure. Sure. Yeah. April 19th, he was involved with a, dis- a domestic dispute with uh, Miss Elizabeth, um, where he hit her. Police have found Elizabeth with two black eyes and a Oops. bumper head and a cut lip. Like, holy shit. Uh, so, less than a month later, she had passed away. So, I was like, dude. And then, like, in 05, he gets, he gets uh, taken off the plane. He was charged with violating his probation. And, and then after that, he got that nerve impingement, and it led to his paralysis. So he was paralyzed for a while. And then he had a spinal stroke. So he had no movement in his arms or his legs. Wow. And now he's up to a point right now where, you know, you know he turned to Jesus because a lot of times where you have no one else to turn to and everyone, you know, you know had enough of you at this point, well-deserved. Right. Um Sometimes God's the last, your last, your last, uh, last lifeline there, and yep. and I'm happy to say that uh, he got his life together. So happy for Lex. I think he gets a bad rap overall. I'd like to see him come back. Maybe do some stuff on TV. I mean, not obviously nothing physical, but you know, you know, do have some fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because his interviews were fantastic, and he's he's funny, and he's like, like he understands like you know why this worked, and he always puts like. You know, Flair made me. You know, I wasn't me in those matches. It was Flair. You know what I mean? So he's understanding, like, you know, it's not self-deprecating, but it's like, all right, I, you know, I, I'm not the best wrestler in the world. Yeah. But I got pretty far. And then from what I understand, um, now he works with the WWE on their wellness policy. So, wow. Uh, not that kind of wellness policy. 
the other type of wellness policy or program. I'm sorry, wellness program. So he counsels athletes on nutrition, exercise, taking care of their bodies, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, learning to train with Lex Luger is not a bad thing. You know, not training in the ring, but, you know, maybe training in the right room. Right. So, you know, because he had one, though. Would, would you put him in five, top five bodies all the time? Yeah. Early on, sure. He was, he was insanely jacked. I mean, he wasn't as big as Hogan, but he was more defined, more cut up. Um, was bigger than Rude. So I would put him. I would put him maybe top two or three of all time, but just you know, just good bodies. You know, was in the WBF too for a while before that folded. He didn't do anything. He got in that uh, motorcycle accident. Yeah, and then he couldn't. Uh, he couldn't be a guest poser on the WBF show. Then he became the Lexicist, as I called him. The Lexicist. That's what that's what Perfect called him on a pay per view. <laughs> like, like uh, Perfect. It was WrestleMania nine. He's got a promo on him. And he calls him the Lexicist, so that's what I call him. So I think that's <laughs> hilarious. Oh. He's like, oh, I'm so excited. Ah, the Lexicist. I do want to talk about that show at some point, uh, WrestleMania 9, because uh, it's a doozy. Sure. And I can't talk about Lex Luger without talking about my favorite angle of all time. And I've mentioned this before because it is my favorite angle of all time. So he come back. To, he's come back to WCW. He is a tweener. Like he's a babyface at first, turns on Hogan, joins the Dungeon of Doom as an auxiliary, or he wasn't in the Dungeon of Doom, but he was an ally with the Dungeon of Doom. And then he um, formed a team with Sting. Luger's still in the Dungeon. Like he's managed by Jimmy Hart, but he's not in the Dungeon of Doom specifically. So I'll make that clear. So it's Jimmy Hart heel, Luger heel, Sting babyface, and they're a tag team. And they win the tag team championship. And what's what's interesting for that? What's interesting about that to me is that, like, Luke is still doing heel shit, but like it's behind Sting's back, so Sting doesn't know he's doing heel shit. Like he'll uh-huh. cheat. And, like, he like he'll like for example, he would like hit someone with a chair, and Sting would be like out, and then Sting covers him one two three, and like oh yeah we won, yay, and Sting would have no idea. Like so they kept on doing that. I think they were champs when the you know, when the NWA the NWO was first started. I think they. had just won the belts. Um, that's when the NWO almost got shot. I'll tell the story. I want to say it was Harlem Heat versus Thing and Luger for the belts. Luger and Thing have the belts. Harlem Heat are the challengers. They had the match, blah, 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 blah. Hall and Nash show up. And this is like the, the, the third or fourth sh- shot like in there. Like there's, they're, they're really new. This might have been before Hogan. You know, they had the match. They come down the ring and like, Two dozen cops enter the ring, like ready to shoot these guys, and then a har- and then a Booker T does a roll up like on Luger one two three new champs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's 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 like oh it's like you didn't call the match. There's like ninety cops in the ring ready to shoot the NWO, but you guys didn't call it. Okay, but it's like that angle struck a chord with me because it's 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 one of the most realistic angles I've ever seen in wrestling because we all have friends in life, right? We all have friends. Sometimes our friends are heels. Like we have, I've, I've had a couple of bad friends that are bad dudes. Still, my friend still do anything for them. You know, would it be like bailing someone out of jail at two o'clock in the morning? You know, we all have we all have bad friends. Um, we all have heel friends. So you know, you know, we not we not we not agree with everything they have to say, or you know, religious stance or political stance or what have you. But at the end of the day, they're still. They're still our friend, and I feel I, I super relate to that angle for some reason, and it wasn't you know it wasn't done for very long, and the NWO came in full force at that point. It was done, but you know, I always find that really interesting. So Matt, have you ever had any heel friends? Uh, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. to us we're the baby face, right? Yourself, you're always the baby face. Right, right. Yeah, you know. yeah. I've had a few of those. I won't name names, but uh. I think, yeah, I, well, the, those friends usually, the ones that are real heels, you try to avoid after a while. As you get older, those are the ones that usually fall by the wayside for the most part. Right. But, it, you know, it's real, it's a real interesting dynamic. It's something I would bring back today because I think today that would work awesome. You know, like a Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens thing. Like, they're tag teams and and they're friends again, but Steen still does, uh, Owens still does heel stuff and then... <laughs> and Sammy doesn't see it. Right. 
you know, makes you know makes Samuel look weird, but but for Sting to do that because people turn on Sting all the time, like he's the most trusting person in wrestling. Like Flair turned on him four times, I think. It's, <laughs> it's like, you know, you know when Flair becomes his friend, he's gonna turn on him. Like you know, you know that was just you know. But Sting and Luger was like, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're real friends. We're real friends. Yeah, he's a bad guy. <laughs> Uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's good stuff. So, uh, any uh, final thoughts on the total package, the Lexicist Lex Luger? No, I just uh, I always enjoyed his work uh, until he got to be too immobile and right. forced down our throats. Do you think? Do you get? To get to, do you think he gets too much shit? Yeah, I mean, I think he was like you said. If he was there today, he would be a huge, huge star. Huge. You know, as long as you keep him out of the red, white, and blue trunks. Right. right, and you know, you give him his. Hey, why do you stop doing that? He get cheap. Luger used to have different colored trunks all the time. Right. I mean, he went back to WCW. He just used the black. Right. You no, know? let's see some color from Luger every once in a while. But I guess they're all doing that. Everyone was dressed in black in, in the late nineties. Yeah, I guess that was kind of the thing. But you no, know, even had white trunks. You know, make him stand out a little bit. I'm not saying to go like neon pink, like not Steiner Brothers colors, because they were obnoxious. Yeah. Remember Scotty with like the hot pink fucking shit? And oh, the lime, yeah. lime green? And fucking hey, dude. But you know. You know, I think I think Luger Luger's a punchline, and I don't think he deserves that. So Lex Luger, my good friend, if I ever see you, I'm gonna give you a high five and we'll tell you how awesome you are and, and we'll we'll take that picture. So you know. Hope I get an opportunity to uh, see you. Maybe sooner, you know, than later, perhaps. We'll see. <laughs> yep. So, guys, um, we are rapidly running out of time. So, again, I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, HighSpots.com uh, with their subscription service. I was actually really impressed because uh, for wrestling, um, it's got the New Japan one, it's got the High Spots one. Um, looking at a couple other ones to get down the road because I can't get enough professional wrestling. It makes me weird. <laughs> What are you gonna do? Real interesting about high spots. They have a lot of like ECW fan cam shows, which is weird. Um, they have RF video shoots, um, so they must have you know obtained the rights you know for that. Um, they have their own shoots. They have documentaries that they've got done on a Kickstarter. They have you know whatever matches that Vince doesn't own, and I guess was available. They got a lot of them, so you'll see some really good stuff. But they have some really good stuff from St. Louis. Um, I know Vince owns Memphis stuff now, but they must have cut a deal before because they got a lot of awesome Memphis stuff. Like they have like so much. So if you're into classic wrestling, good place to start. Um, looking at for your uh, classic wrestling kind of uh, fix. If you like modern wrestling, you get all your PWG shows. They got PWG on there. So if you're a big fan of PWG, um, they have what seems like I want to say over a hundred shows of PWG on there. Um, again, I don't have the, the account right in front of me, but quite a bit. They got AEW on there, which is a, a, a kind of a good indie to watch if you're into it. You got CZW. Uh, I know I made my uh, CZW makes me get a little bit uncomfortable, but they have it if you're into it. Um, so they have lots of you know lots of great stuff on there, and they have the you know all the shoot interviews. They have that really, I think it's like six, seven, eight hour Flair shoot interview on there. Wow. So if you're really interested to see what Flair has to say. Um, this is right when he retired, so it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit older, but you know, still, you know, still really good. Um, they have a bunch of Cornette stuff in there if you like Cornette. They got a lot of interviews with like the Crockett's on there, so they got an interview with like David Crockett. They got an interview with like J.G. Dillon about uh, Mid Atlantic. So um, lots of great resources. Again, you know, in doing the 1983 project, a lot of stuff that I'm looking into. So uh, I definitely recommend them. Um, and no issues with the streaming service. Um, everything streams fine. So I have no issues there. I use a Chromecast to stream it right to my television because I don't like watching, you know, TV on a computer. It's weird to me. So I got my Chromecast out. I hit the uh, the cast button on my computer here, and it goes right to my TV. And it's it's, it's pretty good. So, um, so I just want to get that out of the way, and I'll be watching more uh, stuff from High Spots um, for the remainder of this week. So, any suggestions? Uh, please leave some suggestions in the comment sections of stuff I should check out. <laughs> in terms of other, I know NWA has one now, like the like the legit NWA. Like um, they got sold, 
or something. Like someone bought it. Like, which is still I don't understand how someone would, would be able to buy it. I guess you can. Uh, but on their NWA uh, NWA Ringside dot uh, com, they have a streaming service too. At some point, I'm going to check that out as well. So, <laughs> you know, you know, what are you going to do? It's going to be awesome. So, so um, we are we are now officially out of time. Come back next time where we'll uh, we'll go right into Memphis, Tennessee at the mid South Coliseum. We'll see Randy Savage versus Jerry Lawler for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. <laughs>